Another newly noted podcast comes to you from the Coach's Podcast Room at Spurrier's Gridiron Grill in Celebration Point. Okay, and welcome into another edition of another Dooley Noted Podcast presented by Titan MRI from the Melvin Law Dooley Dome Gator Studios. Appreciate all of you for watching or listening. Uh, today, Chris Doring is going to join us and we'll talk about Florida spring game and some of the other springs around the country. Um, and then, of course, Monday, Coach Spurrier will be back on with us again. Um, I will get to Billy Napier in a minute. He told a, a pretty good Spurrier story. I'm trying to decide whether to save it for some of the speeches I have to give or not, but I'll, I'll tell it to you guys. It's pretty good. Um, all right, let's go to our process service of Gainesville. Starting five, we appreciate Scott Hart and the process service of Gainesville. And uh, they're, I'm sure they're like everybody else, dealing with the weather today. But, of course, that this storm has pretty much blown through now. And uh, we'll be playing and, and golf in the Masters pretty soon. I won't be playing golf at the Masters, but there will be golfers playing at the Masters. And I'll, I will be watching it, I promise you that. Um, so let's get to uh, number one. And, of course, the biggest story that's happened today, or, or in a while, is O.J. Simpson passing away at the age of 76 from cancer. Um, as a cancer survivor, I can understand um, how his family feels. And they didn't do anything wrong. Uh, but I will just, and, and I got, I, I'm trying to choose my words carefully here. Okay. OJ Simpson was a great football player. He was a mediocre actor. He was a miserable, despicable human being. Um, and, you know, if there is a hell, you know where he's going. But um, I think that, that that it's been kind of interesting to watch today because it's I don't want to say it's like the Donald Trump thing where you either love him or you hate him, um, because I think this nation's way more divided on Donald Trump than they are on O.J. Simpson. Ninety percent of America, I think, hates him and, and maybe 10 percent still love him. And of course, look. As you know, that trial was about was not even about O.J. Simpson. It was about the L.A. police and how it mishandled the prosecutors did a job of it. Um, it and it is what happened. OK, With nothing we can do to take that back. And um, certainly, um, you know, it was a it was a I remember right where I was. I was sitting in a press conference, was getting ready to start and um, for baseball. Uh, Andy Lopez, they were having a, getting ready to have a baseball conference. I think it was about regionals. And uh, right as that was getting ready to start, we had to, we wanted to watch the ver verdict, and it came in, and I was like, I can't believe that. And, of course, some people celebrate it. It's been interesting, though, to watch different people. Now, there have been people, again, who have come out and said, you know, he was really good to me. I liked him a lot, and, you know, he was not convicted. We'll never know what really happened to those people. Yeah. He's still looking for the killers, right? Now, who's going to do it now that he's gone? Uh, yeah, I got to be careful here. <laughs> Look, despise the person for what he did. As a football player, liked him a lot. I, I was stunned that the Heisman people put out a um, a thing today, and 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 basically said that they're sorry to see the passing, and they they were you know they were did the right thing, and they were saying you know, prayers for his family, which we all feel that way. You know, they didn't do anything wrong. Um, unfortunately, part of his family is not here anymore because he chopped their head off. So, um, and then you hear ESPN's bringing on all their big, big guns, you know, the Stephen A's and the Jeremy Shapps by phone because this happened really just um, an hour ago when my wife burst in and told me about it. Um but they're bringing them all in, and they're they're saying this, and I agree with it 100%. The, the, the young lady who's doing the um, – and I'm not even sure who's doing it because I've always been listening to it. Uh, the broadcast is, saying, is asking all these guys, all right, how do you balance his legacy? And every one of them has said the same thing. There's no balance. You don't balance a legacy of a guy who was a great football player and a double murder. You can't do that. And so, look – I've seen the video of the um, of the thing he did go to jail for, and it's really bad, too. That was bad enough. I always go back to this moment in time. I'm watching the game on NBC, 
and and they're ready to go down to OJ Simpson, right? Who's on the field? He was a sideline guy then. All right, we're going to go down to the Jews, and you know, I think it was a Browns game. And they went, wait, wait, uh, we've been told in our ear we have to go, we have to get to another game. And they were on OJ, and he was so mad. And I was like, whoa, I didn't know that guy could get that angry. And it was like scary. And I like that came back to me after all this stuff happened. Anyway, we'll, we'll leave it right there. I know that Jeff and I will talk about it a lot on the tailgate probably the next couple of days. But um, anyway. So that's number one on the process servers of games. I'll start back. Wanted to start you off on a high, highlight note. Um, but number two is, um, certainly is depressing, certainly not life and death, but it is depressing. And that's what happened with Florida baseball. Uh, on Tuesday, they get run ruled by FSU. The game is not competitive. They give up 11 runs the first two innings. Uh, FSU has scored 45 runs against Florida this year in three games. FSU, the team that always lost to Florida, but that Sully owned. Uh, he's clearly not getting through to them, and he is trying just about everything. And I, it's not like he's given up. You know, Jeff was talking yesterday, and I, and again, he knows what's going on over there more than anybody, that it's clear the bench time. And I don't mean clear the bench, get all the guys in who haven't been playing. It's the guys who aren't getting, aren't being enthusiastic friend, uh, you know, friends of their teammates and aren't really into it and everything. Get them off the bench. And so we may see some changes here. I think one of the problems, and it's not Jack's problem, but Jack Caglione's not a vocal leader. And some guys, it's very easy. Chris Leak was that way. You know, it's very easy to say you need to be more of a vocal leader. It's, some, it's just not in some people. They just can't do it. And so um, obviously that, um, we'll see what he can do. Let's see if he can do anything. But look, it's not going to get easier. You you go you have to play this week obviously uh, against South Carolina. Then you got to go to Vanderbilt and Arkansas back to back. It's not getting easier, guys. And and I don't know where this team is headed. Uh, I hope this is the low point right here, losing four in a row, including three to a team that had only won one SEC game, and then getting swept by FSU. I hope it's the low point for this season. Uh, and you know that Sully is going to have to figure things out going forward, not just for this year, but for the following years. I and mean, he's not going to have Jack Caglione after this year. He's not going to have a bunch of other guys. But uh, it's been kind of sad, to be honest with you. Um, I really go back to the beginning of the year when Sully told me and told all the other writers, um, I can't wait to coach this team. It's going to be fun, man. We had such a great year last year, and we get a lot of those guys back. But, you know, you don't have back as Wyatt Langford, obviously, and nothing you can do about that. And you don't have your pitchers back. So that's a big part of it. But um, it just aren't very good. And I thought they were better than they were. And even those midweek losses, I go, well, but they're winning the series. Then you go up there and you lose three in a row and you get swept by FSU. It's not surprising FSU won in Tallahassee. Had a great atmosphere, great crowd over there and everything. And sometimes you just lose those games. That's fine. But you can't be where you are right now, 17 and 15. Um, so we'll see what Sully does going forward, whether he's able to pull him out of this tailspin. And if not, he's going to have to do a better job of with the portal, I guess, you know, this year they spent all their money kind of on two players. One of them hadn't done anything and one of them is Homer or bust. So, um, it is what it is. Uh, and, and in fact, in that game, they, what, they had two solo homers in the first inning. You're like, okay, there you go. That's all they do is hit solo homers, it seems like. All right, number three on the process service of Gainesville starting five. More bad news, and that was softball last night. Hey, look, you know how hard it was to pick an uh, Adams Ribco to go player, SC Gator of the week? We did not have a good week here in Gainesville. Uh, but softball, who had won 26 in a row, in fact, I don't think they'd ever lost to um, South Florida, not only lost, they give up six runs in one inning. And you say, well, why didn't he stop the bleed? Why didn't Tim Walton stop the bleed? He put all three of his pitchers in there. Finally, Olivia, Olivia Miller got out of it, but by then they'd already scored six runs. Um, so I don't know what's going on there with this team. It's it's like we talk a lot about how the pitching is better, but then they'll have one game, if you remember the game a couple of weeks ago where they gave up, they were up 12-6 and lost, looked like last year. 
Uh, again, these are freshman pitchers, and that's a, a part of it. Um, but it certainly uh, was stunning to see that result after they'd beaten them 11-3 before. But, you know, in baseball and softball, it, it, anybody can win any game. It's just, it's a very, you throw the ball, you catch the ball, you hit the ball. But what do we have here? Lollygaggers. <laughs> Um, but that's what it is. I mean, it's, it's, I don't, these guys aren't lollygagging. They're just struggling a little bit. So we'll see how that goes, um, going forward. They get, they, they got to go to Missouri. Not going to be easy again this week. And I think I heard on the radio last night, I was listening to the radio coming, um, home last night. And they said that that game against South Florida was their last game against a non ranked team. How'd that go? So not well. So again, Tim Walton's got to figure out, you know, what he's going to do down the stretch. Again, they're 34 and 7. It's not like they're bad. They're still going to be a regional host and hopefully a super regional host, although that doesn't guarantee anything either, especially when you've just lost to South Florida. All right, let's get to number four on our process service of games, the starting five. And that was Billy Napier at the quarterback club Tuesday. And if you weren't there, man, you missed a great talk. He was, it's the same thing I've said before. You listen to him give a talk like that, and you go, "Man, Florida's going to be all right. They're going to be fine. They're 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 going to win games. They're going to win more games than a lot of people think." And then you watch him play, and of course you go, "And then they're five and seven. Uh, and that is the problem. And he even addressed that. Now again, I the quarterback club has a policy: what you what you hear there stays there. But there are certain things that he said before that I know I can talk about. Um, and and he said to other people, and that it, you know the the number one thing was look we're getting it done in every way possible with citizenship with academics with developing better players with with recruiting very much like Dan Hurley the parents of the players and if if they don't have parents that are you know where you're hearing voices from other people. Um, that we're not going to recruit you, that kind of thing, which is exactly what Danny Hurley said the other day. But we got to do it on the field. And that's the bottom line. They're, they've they got everything in place right now, finally. After, and it wasn't easy. You walk into this job with a, a, a team that is bereft of talent, I guess I could say. They, they had some players, but they didn't have enough. You know that. In fact, I'll tell that Spurrier story that he told real quick because it's funny. And he said, he talked to Spurrier when he got the job and he said, you know, Billy, when I took the job here, I, my team was loaded. I, I walked in and they, I, I had a loaded team. He goes, you don't have that luxury. <laughs> you better get off the phone and start recruiting because Steve knows when you have good players or not. And they did. They didn't have good players. Um, but I mean, that's the bottom line. Got to show it on the field. You're doing all the right things. Got to show it on the field. You got to win games. Somebody asked me at the club, what's the target? How many do you think he needs to win? And I said, 13. You win 13, you're going to be around a lot. Of course, that's not the case. Um, he's not going to win 13. But, you know, he gave me a good idea for a column. I, I will say that. You have to read it later on. But, uh, th look, I... Again, I walked away from that meeting going, Florida's fine. Florida's going to be great. And I get the impression that all the people who, um, it, that matter, that make decisions on this, are, are in that same boat. But still, you still got to win. You can't go five and seven again. And th th at that point, you say, I know the schedule is tough. I know you inherited a mess. But. You know, you, you can't keep losing games. It's the bottom line. So um, we'll see what happens there. Um, they, By the way, the quarterback club is having an unbelievable speaking. They always have incredible speakers. Of course, I only do the scouting reports. I had to kill 30 minutes in this one because he was a late coming, which is fine. I ended up telling some Rodney Dangerfield jokes, but uh, seemed to go over well. Uh, but the speakers they have coming, I know they have Dan Mullins coming. I wonder if anybody will ask him, Coach, um, most people believe that you left a mess behind. I'm just wondering your response. I don't, I don't know if that question will come up. 
They've got Jesse Palmer's coming to speak. Um, I know that um, Ali Peak Wilbur and, and Eric Wilbur are going to come and do a husband wife thing. Uh, who else did they have coming? Um, oh, Jimbo Fisher. That'll be fun. <laughs> oh, I got some. I got some jokes. I'll have to tell that one. All right. Finally, number five on our process service of Gainesville starting five, and that is. I saw this headline on the in the athletic and said the most is it the most pivotal masters ever because of where we are in golf. And we all know what the ratings were like, have been like. And a lot of people don't like the split. And a lot of let's let's face it, a lot of people don't want to watch John Rahm play golf on the Live Tour, and they can't watch him play on the on this on the PGA tour. Or, or and if that's their favorite golfer, they really have lost interest in the game. If you want to watch Brooke, Brooks Kepka on the Live Tour, you know, whatever, you're probably not. But the split, it's a civil war, as they talked about it. And I would think a civil war is going to mean great numbers in the ratings, especially if Tiger can make another cut. He's made 24 in a row. If he can make another cut, that, that bumps the eyeballs up. But I would think because all these guys are going head to head, and this is the one time they get to do it, and then they'll get to do it again in the U.S. Open. The majors have become kind of the battleground here. I, I will say this, though. So if, if somebody from the Live Tour wins it, that doesn't mean the Live Tour was right. If somebody from the PGA Tour wins it, doesn't mean the PGA Tour was right. It just means somebody was really good. You know, you weren't going over there and getting crappy golfers. You got some that are mediocre, but you got great players in the Live Tour. You know, I'm not a fan of it. I don't watch it very much. I mean, I'm watching about probably a total of five minutes in my life. Um, but we'll see what happens there. Uh, but again, Masters was rained out earlier this morning, but it, they're getting ready to tee off again. I can't wait to um, – I'm sure that Jeff will have it on at the uh, – we'll make him put it on at the radio show today and tomorrow. But um, – so not much golf to talk about. And I wouldn't really talk about it much anyway, because by the time you listen to it, everything would have changed. So uh, the point is, uh, it'll, it's a civil war and we'll see how it does. I'm just, I'm really curious about the numbers on the uh, this turn. And on the, Masters is always so, people get so excited about it. I know many more than me, but especially when you've got these sides going head to head. Now they're all getting along. It's not, they were all at the champions dinner. I think there were seven live guys there because they won the masters. Uh, we'll see what happens there. All right. We'll take a break here. We'll come back with Chris Doring. We'll talk some spring football with him and play yes, nowhere. Maybe with him, he'll be coming to you on our big mills, cheesesteak zoom line. And of course, yes, nowhere, maybe sponsored by big mills, cheesesteak. So we'll be back with that. Right after we take a break here on another Duly Noted, presented by Titan MRI from the Meldon Law Duly Dome Gator Studios. I was driving behind a lady, and very suddenly she moved out of the way. There was a log laying in the road, and when I hit my brakes, I went on top of the log. I had two herniated discs. I just haven't been the same since. Jeffrey Meldon fought for me all the way. Him and his team really went there for me. Throughout the whole lawsuit, he made sure that my bills was paid. It was never no whenever I called him and asked him for something. Call Meldon Law right now. Hello there, everybody. I'm Pat Dula, of course, from another Duly Noted podcast. And this is a great Adam Brewer, and he's just opened up a place here, Adam Brewer to go. Uh, what would give you the idea to do this, to have a to go place? Like uh, we really like the fast concept. You know, being able to get the barbecue. Uh, now we have this new online ordering. So we before it was a call ahead, carry out, quick service. Um, we have like a curbside kind of a deal where um, you know you're, you're, everything's ready to go for you. Um, and then we thought, wow, we have a really great dine-in concept, but uh, how can we make this you know, streamlined for the customer and make it easy and accessible uh, for all parts of town? Adam's Rib Code to go. Come on down and enjoy it. Process Service of Gainesville offers a rapid turnaround on affidavits of service for Gator lawyers locally and nationwide. Our friend Scott Hart offers immediate responses on status requests and is a member of NAPS and FAPS. And he has been a part of the community for almost two decades. Need service? Call Process Service of Gainesville at 407-697-9592 
or email shartgators, that's G-A-T-R, at yahoo.com. And make sure you ask about the paralegal legal secretary bonus program. Okay, and welcome back to another Duly Noted podcast presented by Titan MRI from the Melvin Law Duly Dome Gator Studios. And it's always a great pleasure to talk to our guest today, Chris Doring, All-American wide receiver, All-American guy, All-American broadcaster. I could I could talk positive about Chris forever. I appreciate and that. Also, all American friend. I was going to say all American friend. I'd like to have that on the resume. There, it's good to be with you, Pat. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. And uh, you got the game Saturday, and that's going to be interesting to see what we uh, are, is on display. Just uh, we had Coach uh, Napier at the quarterback club, and it was very interesting the stuff you had to say. And yeah. I know you probably talked to him as well. I heard there was uh, a lot of. Uh, real transparency that uh, yeah. went on there, which was, you know, kind of a, a breath of fresh air to hear, um, you know, coaches speaking with a little candor instead of the co- typical coach speak. But I don't know about you, man. I, I've, I've, uh, this spring, I've been on a little bit of a tour. I was up in Knoxville for their pro day. I got a chance to watch Tennessee's first scrimmage of the spring, uh, was in Auburn last week for Saturday's a game, a day game. And then uh, obviously we'll have Florida this week. I went to practice on Tuesday. I'll go Thursday afternoon as well. I don't know that I've ever gone into or through a spring and known less about more teams, right? You know, as I look at Florida, like, I don't really know what to expect. Obviously, the focal point is is DJ Lagway, but the real determining factor of what's going to happen this season has more to do with Graham Mertz than anything else. Um, Defensively, yeah, they're going to be better tackling than they were last year. They can't be any worse, so that's a positive, but... I just I I don't feel like I know the personnel that well. I, I don't necessarily know anything more than the pressure seems to be squarely on Billy Napier and this year's team, particularly because of what happened last season and the daunting schedule they face this season. Yeah, and he was very good about talking about that, and he knows that. And and uh, look, and I, I know what he's doing with these kids, and um, you know, make making them be serve doing service work and doing all this stuff and academics have never been better and all that. And I, I, we all appreciate that, but he knows you still have to transfer that to the field. You know, what's interesting is this week we've talked an awful lot on our show about Cal leaving Kentucky to go to, to Arkansas. And, and one of the biggest points of, of, of bragging from Cal has been the number of guys they put into the NBA, the number of first round picks, the number of all-stars, all of that's great, but you're hired not only to develop players, but to win games. And right. so you can you can say everything you want about the the great point average and the good works that that players are doing. That's all great. I think you know to to uh, some degree, that's what we celebrated Will Muschamp for. Will Muschamp changed the the whole program, um, but they didn't win enough games for for a lot of the fans, and that that cut his tenure short. So. You know, you can do all of that, but if, if you don't find a way to win a few more games this year, it, it, it's going to be tough sledding going forward. And I, I don't, I honestly think they can be a better team. And I have a hard time seeing that the win loss ratio is much improved uh, over 2023. Yeah, no, I know. And that's what everybody keeps pointing to. And he was asked about that and he had a really good comment on it. But I know some things you kind of keep there, but it was pretty interesting what he had to say about it. And I know the players, he's given. He's, you can tell by talking to them, he has put it in their head that, hey, bring on a tough schedule. What do you, we don't want to play Samford every game. Yeah, competitors want to play in big ball games. And, and, and that's what is kind of hard for me in this day and age of, of the mindset shifting from, hey, I want to be a part of something that we're going to build championships from. I want to go join a team that's already winning championships. Look at Trevor Etienne deciding to go to Georgia because he wanted to be a part of a winner. That mentality goes back to the NBA. That goes back to you know guys like Kevin Durant wanting to join super teams to win a, a championship instead of being the reason that a team goes from being close to getting over that hurdle. I don't have much patience for that type of mentality. I know it's it's kind of common amongst college and, and professional athletes now, but you know I, I think you have to find a way to move past what you think your own limitations are. And and I think in order for this team to get past that, they're going to have to get past the idea that there's a lot of dysfunction and disorganization on the sideline. That was one of the most embarrassing things to me last year was how disorganized they looked from week one against Utah all the way through the season to Florida State where you get a big stop on third down and you spit in a guy's face and you, you the whole momentum of the game changes. So. They've got to show me that they've addressed some of the issues that have caused the penalties, 
that have caused the, the, the games that they should have won to slip through their fingers. Like uh, that, that, that's as much on the coaches in changing the trajectory as it is on these players. Yeah. And he did talk about it. He did. They've got to coach better. And there's no doubt about it, which is, you know, Coach Spurrier would say when when they would when you guys lost a game, and it wasn't very often, I know, but when you lost a game, he would all it would never be Danny's got to play better, Chris has got to do this. It's I got to coach better. The coach I don't know if he meant it all the time, but he he definitely said it, though, right? Yeah. I mean, he certainly uh, <laughs> took the blame in that respect. Yeah, I you know it's I I feel honored to have you on because I I assume I'm you're I'm you're talking on the same headset you talked to Alyssa Lang on so this is I, I, there's a lot of Alyssa Lang fans when I go like I get people that are at games that she's on that send me pictures of her which is kind of creepy but kind of cool at the same time <laughs> I mean she's my girl I, I'm so blessed to to work with her PB Dari I mean these these folks are are such great professionals, but uh, tremendous friends as well. And, and uh, it, it's a pleasure getting to do what I do with them on Sirius and on the SEC network. Yeah. I'm not sending any pictures to Alyssa. I mean, trust me, but uh, she is just a sweetheart. I really like her a lot. Um, let me ask about your position because um, obviously Trey Wilson had a great year last year, but there's not much else coming back. And that's where I, I'm, I'm worried about their ability to make big plays out there. You know, I, I trust you know, there are things that I have questions about as it relates to the coaching staff, but there are things that I trust. And over the last couple of years, I trust their ability to evaluate talent through the transfer portal. You know, going back to what we saw from Ricky Pearsall, I, I hadn't even heard of Ricky Pearsall. He comes in and turns in, you know, maybe one of the best seasons in the in the history of the program in, in 2023. Uh Finding Graham Mertz. Graham Mertz, in a lot of people's minds, was ready to be cast on the trash pile. He was probably a, a bottom five quarterback in the heading into the season last year. And I think most people ranked it, if you looked at it after the season, you'd rank him as a top five quarterback. So the talent, the understanding of you're projecting what a guy can look like in your system, right. Cam Jackson, what they, they've added there. So I trust their ability to go out and, and make additions to the transfer portal. But the kid from Wisconsin, um, I had a chance to watch him the other day. I'm excited to see what, what he can bring. Uh, there's some young players that I, I, I think are going to have to step up, Aiden Mizell being one that we've heard a lot about. But um, I actually think there's more for, for the hometown kid, Khalil Jackson. I, I'm, I'm excited. He, I'm standing next to him at practice. I, I was there with his dad, Willie, and, and Khalil walks by. Khalil dwarfed both of us, and we're both fairly <laughs> large dudes. So I'm actually excited. I, I, I'm I'm optimistic that the offensive line could be better. I think kicking Damian George down into guard is, is a big move. Obviously, Austin Barber's out right now. Uh, getting him back at left tackle will be big, but you know, hopefully the off uh, it comes down to lines of skirmish. Offensive line's got to be better, and certainly the defensive line has to be more stout. And that, it, As long as you've been around here, as long as I've been a Gator fan, we've always had tremendous defensive line play, and it seems like we've had a bit of a void there in the last couple seasons. Well, not only that, Chris, but you know that uh, this was, for a while, was legitimately called DBU. Yeah. Hargraves, Quincy Wilson, guys like that that were great defensive players, ended up uh, uh, even uh, Kyrie Elam. But, man, it has dropped off. And, and I mean, they've got to get better at safety. they got to get better at the corners. Uh, I think they feel like they, they are, are getting better and they get the right coaches. Uh, that coaching change was a stunner in a little way. But then you started thinking about it, and you go, oh, it makes sense. Yeah. Harris, the, the guy that got back there in the secondary, everybody's raved about his impact in the short time he's been in Gainesville. Uh, the new defensive line coach is another one. Uh, what's the name? Chapman, I think it is. Yeah. is uh, another one. That I got to get brushed up on the names here because it's such turnover <laughs> with coaches and players before Saturday, so I get that straight. But it, it those are the two coaches that I think have been talked about the most in terms of making an impact on their respective position groups, particularly the defensive line from guys I've talked to out there holding that, that group to a much higher level of accountability. The stories have been about those guys losing some weight and certainly they need to lose some weight. They still probably need to lose a considerable amount of weight, but um, I'm hopeful that, uh, that the impact of some new voices on those two position groups can help make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, I, there, there, I think, Desmond Watson's lost like 50 pounds or something. He needs about another like, 150 probably, yeah. right? I mean, <laughs> it's I've never seen a guy that big. And, and he's effective, but you can't play yeah. more than a couple downs at that weight. And he's effective at certain things. And and uh, I know, like, for example, two years ago, Tennessee's plan was we got to go fast because we got to keep him on the field. Yeah, We can't let him get off the field. And that's 
that's not what you want ideally there. Um, I did want to talk to you about uh, the SEC and college football in general. There's been a lot of discussion about what's going to happen here and you know where we're going to go forward and whether the SEC and the Big Ten are just going to make this power conference and and make make all the rules and change all the rules. And I, I mean, how do you feel about the the future of college football right now? It's scary, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't look like anything that I've ever watched as a fan or play, been a part of as a player, and and it it seems to all be happening so quickly at the same time. And there's nobody there to kind of enforce the rules that you do have. I mean, it, you're not supposed to use. Uh, recruiting inducements to bring kids to campus. Everybody, it's coming down to how much you're going to pay me. Coaches openly talk about that. You're not supposed to have pay for play. Well, that's happening as well. You're not supposed to be tampering with people's rosters. That happens routinely. Like, who's going to start enforcing the rules? And and so, uh, I I do think there has to be some structure. The NCAA is not the group to do it. They're terrified of litigation. Every time they go to court, they get beat down. So uh, I think we're closer than a lot of people think to power conferences just kind of breaking off and doing their own thing for the, the overall health of the game. And I think it's it's an interesting perspective for Commissioner Sankey and, and Patini to be in. Like you, you have to watch out for your own conference first, but if the health of the sport in general is not there, you, your conference is going to suffer as well. So I, I do think that those two guys have to kind of lead the way into the future of college football. I, I trust Commissioner Sankey more than than anybody when it comes to leadership and and being patient and and doing the due diligence and making good decisions. So I, I think it'll happen. But what we're experiencing right now is just absolutely ridiculous. It's it's wild and crazy. And it's like you said, you were talking about names and everything. And uh, the other night when Coach Napier was talking about players that they had gotten in the portal that they were excited about and this guy and this guy. And, and I was like, I, I don't even know what position he plays. I yeah. don't even know who you're talking about. <laughs> it's embarrassing for me. I go out to practice on Tuesday and I'm asking guys, they're mentioning names. I'm like, uh, who's that? What number is he? You know, it's, uh, I'll have my, my board with me today, but it's, it's tough. You know, uh, I was in Auburn on Saturday. I think they had 20 new players, 29 new players that were making their debut in the spring, 18 from high school and 11 through the transfer portal. I have to imagine that Florida's in a similar situation as well. That was what was so remarkable about what Ole Miss did last year was all the influx of transfer portal acquisitions. And they actually had a pretty decent chemistry amongst the team. I think that's a, a hit or miss kind of thing from year to year. I'm anxious to see what uh, Lane Kiffin can do this season. But I, I guess it's just a matter of, of being able to hang on to your core guys and trying to add the, the pieces around them that uh, buy into the, the culture and the system. And, and uh, for one year, maybe you can make a run. Yeah, and it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, a good example was Florida basketball. Yeah. You know, sometimes they would bring in, the, the uh, they brought in these guys and they just haven't worked out. You know, Kerry Blackshear was supposed to, was the biggest get ever. Remember that? Yeah. And it he was, wasn't he like out. SEC player of the year in the preseason, hadn't even played a single yeah. minute for the Gators? <laughs> and, and and then he had that thing with the foot. And never, I never figured yeah. that out. It was weird. Um, but, um and then this year, Todd Golden puts together a really good group of guys, and they they bought into it. And uh, I hate the way it ended, of course. With and of course, the hand logged in injury was bad. Man, you must have grimaced when you saw that. I was sitting right in front of it. I happened to be there in Nashville, and and you know, there's injuries that you immediately know somebody's in bad shape. And um, you know, seeing him writhing in pain and signaling to the sideline, I. I as a parent, watching his parents come out there and what the the anguish they were experiencing, man, I couldn't help it. It teared me up, and um, you know, I just really felt for him. I love the way the team rallied. I love the way that Auburn, you know, kind of rallied around him as well, and the sportsmanship that was shown by those guys. But yeah, I'm excited about the uh, the future of Florida basketball, and and uh, I, nobody more thankful for Todd Golden than than Scott Strickland right now, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, we got to play our game, Yes, No Way, or Maybe, brought to you by Big Mills Cheesesteak, street dining done the right way. Uh, three questions for Chris Doring from the SEC Network. Is that what I call you now, or do I call you? Um, Florida Gator, Gator All-American, um, yeah. NFL veteran, uh, ESPN uh, SEC Network analyst. <laughs> Drinker of shots. Yeah, that too. <laughs> And you get me in trouble sometimes. I, I know, man. I, 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 it, it's a bad combo. You and I, and and Robbie Andrew back in the day. You know, it's uh, it, it's it's recipe for for some trouble. <laughs> it 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 does. All right, let's go with a yes, no, way, or maybe just three questions. Number one, 
uh, for Chris Doring. Oklahoma or Texas wins the SEC in its first year? Ooh. Uh, maybe sounds like a bailout to this question. I'm going to say <laughs> no, um, just because I think it's going to be an adjustment for those guys to come in and play the schedule every single week. I've talked to you about this since I was a player. The grind, physically and mentally, the, the, the toll it takes by the time you get to the end of the season it's tough to make it through. So I, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and say no, just to be a firm committal guy here. Here we go. I like it. All right. Number two, yes, no way, or maybe brought to you by big mills, cheesesteak, Florida makes a bowl game this year. I never thought I'd have to ask that question. I know. Did you ever, I, I never thought, you know, it, for a period of time there, we were going to Atlanta every single year and it felt like that was just a, a rite of passage. But um, to think about not being bowl eligible, that was tough. I'm going to say yes, optimistically, but if they do, it's it's going to be six wins. I have a hard time seeing them at this point get to seven wins. Yeah, it's it's going to be tough. Look, they've got to go. They've got to go either five and zero oh or four and one in the first five games. Yeah, hey, can you think of a? I don't know if I could think of a more important opener in Florida football history than than this year's Miami game, and what that means to Miami as well, with both of the coaches kind of being in the same position. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you can go back to like nobody knew the Houston game in '69 was was going to be that big a deal. We it turned out to be a big deal. I was I was uh, what, uh, four years from being born, so I don't remember that one quite as well. <laughs> I do believe I think was that the one that uh, our boy John Clifford. I, I think he played a, a big part in that game, right? Was Coach Clifford on that team? I think he was. Yeah, uh, yeah, because he was a senior in '71 when uh, Reese and Alvarez were seniors. So yeah, he would have. Yeah. Uh, I, and I, Houston, I really, Houston had a stud running back, right? They had a great receiver, Elmo Wright. Ah, uh, because I remember Elmo Wright invented the the touchdown dance. All he right, was the first guy uh, to do it. Ask Coach Clifford about hitting one of those guys and the uh, the story that that uh, came from the the pile after that. It's a great story. He does a great job, obviously telling stories. I will. I'll tell. I'll ask him. All right. Finally, on yes, no way, or maybe yes, no, or maybe you would beat Peter Burns in a foot race. Yes. If I if I lost to Peter Burns, it, Peter Burns will beat me in golf. There's no question about that. He's certainly not going to outrun me. He's not going to outlift me in the weight room. Not going to beat me in basketball. I, I, there's not much I think that PB can beat. PB is amazingly creative, so maybe on the creativity side, but anything athletic uh, outside of golf, and I don't even know if we can throw that in the being athletic book. But I um <laughs> I'm I'm killing him in a race. Yeah, it's not even. A, well, I just. I'm just saying you need to have more contests with him where you're going to have an advantage. Instead, you're betting on the Gators to win it in baseball and the Gators to win it in football. And that's loyalty. I what you learned in, in playing in the NFL. You know, there, there it doesn't matter what the point spread are. You're never taking points. You're never doing. You're, you're always betting on your alma mater. I, I'm. Well, I think I've lost a lot. Lost the last five times we've bet in general, and. Uh, I'm going to keep doing it. And, and Coach Napier said to me last year as I had to, to dress up in that LSU baseball uniform heading to SEC Media Days, he saw the video and said, man, we got, we got to get you. We got to break the schneid. You got to get you off the schneid there. So uh, I'm hopeful that he remembers that this year when we play uh, uh, against the, the LSU Tigers. I like having him at home, though. Again, the seven home games, and that's that's the key for this team this year. You need You need – to take advantage of what it, what your fans are going to bring. And you know they're going to bring it because they sold out nine games for two losing seasons. Yeah, but think about that, though. It's not like what, what makes you believe that there's a big home field advantage when you lose to Arkansas at home the way that Florida did last year. Like, yeah. you should have a home field advantage. The crowd seems like they're doing their part. But losing to Arkansas at home after the season they had, is it, it's unjustifiable. Yeah, that, that was pretty pathetic. Of course, they make a field goal, you know, they win. Just you know, it's all about execution, all about attention to detail, and 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 being confident in those situations. Well, you've executed today. I promise you that. And, Thank uh, you. We appreciate you so much for coming on, and uh, we'll be back with more of another duly noted podcast presented by Titan MRI from the Meldon Law Duly Dome Gator Studios right after this break. 
Things have certainly got a little out of hand lately when it comes to just buying our everyday necessities. Just look at gas, streaming services, and heck, even chicken wings. Well, there is one necessity that shouldn't cost a ton. Taking care of yourself and helping fix all the aches and pains in life, and the fine folks at Titan MRI agree. With costs a fraction of what you'd pay at a hospital, you'll not only save money, you'll be taken care of by staff with over 20 years experience. So when you need an MRI, call Titan first, and you can go where your doctors send their families. Now offering CAT scans. Great food, great atmosphere, a diverse menu, everything made from scratch, plenty of space, and locally owned. These are all the characteristics of a great restaurant. And you can find each and every one of them right here in Gainesville at Ballyhoo Grill. Ballyhoo Grill prepares all of their food fresh every day from their salad dressing to their award-winning soups. Bring your family and enjoy dinner under the Tim Trebo Tiki Hut while listening to live music. Or if you're running low on time to eat out, they also deliver through Uber Eats, Fight Squad, and Postmates, a Gainesville staple that's been open for over 30 years check out ballyhoo grill on facebook or at ballyhoogrill.com another duly noted podcast comes to you from the coaches podcast room at spurrier's good iron grill and celebration point you can watch and listen to us on facebook and youtube for every podcast that we do on mondays and fridays at two o'clock listen to the podcast whenever on apple Podcasts, spotify google podcasts overcast any of the other 39 platforms where you can find this podcast or your favorite podcast. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments section below or call me if you want to do some advertising at 352-317-3444. Okay, and welcome back to another Duly Noted podcast presented by Titan MRI from the Melvin Law Duly Dome Gator Studios. Again, um, uh, Appreciate Chris, and we'll uh, have uh, Coach Spurrier on Monday. Uh, next Thursday's guest, not sure yet, but we'll have a great guest, I promise you. Um, let's get to our Hester and Kipke three things. And, of course, Hester and Kipke is a Gainesville law firm specializing in the areas of family law and workers' compensation. If you're a loyal listener to this show, you know who we are by now. If not, Google the firm, check out the reviews, and hear what our clients have to say. Ken and Jennifer can be reached. 24-7 via call or text at 352-339-9920. That is Hesser and Kipke, and we appreciate them. All right, let's start off with number one, which is the story with Rasheed Rice. Of course, um, if you haven't heard about what happened there, he's driving a Lamborghini. Is He's got a Corvette that another guy's driving. I think he owns, too. They go on a high-speed chase. It causes this terrible collision. Um, and arrest warrants are now out for Rasheed Rice, and uh, he's going to cooperate with it. And he's taken full responsibility, eight charges against him. Um, and that certainly is its terrible what happened there. And again, I, I, I know he's 23 years old, but man, there's, it's never a good... You would think somebody... And people would have learned something from what happened at Georgia, you know. And again, I'm not blaming Georgia. I'm not, I'm not trying to throw Georgia under the bus here. But what happened there, you know, what happened with and you know, you would think that that would keep you from doing something like that. But young people love to go fast. That's all I can say. Look, I've been, I'm in, I'm living in Gainesville, and where people don't go very fast. Um, but then all of a sudden there'll be one guy on 39th who decides I'm weaving in and out of cars. And, you know, that happens. And you sit there and go, all right, just back off. Let him let him be an idiot. Um, but you're an idiot if you're going 110 miles an hour. It's not allowed. It's against the law. And then you cause an accident that uh, causes terrible suffering. So uh, we'll see where that all ends up going. I If I'm... If I'm the Chiefs, I'm probably thinking I've got to move on because he's going to get suspended one way or another. And he's going to get suspended for probably a lot of games. So we've got to make sure we have another plan. That's what I would think. The NFL will do it. You know that. All right, let's get to another. Boy, it's nothing but good good news stories today. And that, number two is uh, Jonte Porter. Uh, who, of course, plays for the Toronto Raptors. But not now he's not playing because he's been suspended because of betting. It's not that he bet prop bets. It's that he bet prop bets and then manipulate them. That's at least the charge against him. In other words, let's say you bet that uh, John Tay Porter was going to score 14 points in this game, and you get to 12 and you go, you pass the ball. I mean, 
I'm, I'm not saying that happened, but that is the kind of thing we're talking about. This is the problem with gambling in pro sports, especially, and even in college sports, where young people can bet on themselves to fail and then fail. It's not that they, I mean, betting on yourself to succeed, that that's, was the Pete Rose argument. The Pete Rose argument was, oh, I, I bet on the Reds, but I only bet on them to win. Well, then you might pitch a guy that you would normally not pitch. You know, you'd run a closer out there and try to get a third, three inning save out of him and not worry about the rest of the games. That's why you don't like that. Uh, but John Tay Porter, according to uh, Adam Silver, could be banned for life. Could be, have the same thing that Pete Rose got. Uh, because of this. And again, I don't know all the specifics about it, but I do know what prop bets are. And I do know that when, how you manipulate them. And that is, Hey, look, if, if, if I'm betting that I'm going to get over, I'm betting the over on 16 points in this game, I'm taking every shot, man. <laughs> Nobody is getting the ball from me. I'm taking the shot. So, you know, I, but that's a problem. You're having gambling shoved down your throat every day. If you watch any television at all, if you have a, Twitter account. If you have, you're getting nothing but gambling, Cheech and Chong gummies, and Donald Trump. That's all you get on Twitter you know, these days. Um, so it's just crazy. It's crazy. Um, but we'll see what happens with him again. Let's get to number three, which is um, the John Calipari story, and of course how he got to, um, how he got to uh, Arkansas and. He talked about it yesterday. And, it, you know, John Tyson, who's the CEO of Tyson Foods, you know, you've got that money, you've got the, the Walmart money, you've got Jerry Jones money, but the Tyson guy is really close with Calipari. And they, uh, he called him and, and asked him to sit down with the, your check, the uh, AD. And they, they talked it out and they decided that he would be, that he might be the coach. So he went on a trip. And he ran to a, he talked to a Catholic priest he wanted to talk about it. And the priest told him this, walk one way and at for an hour and pretend you're the Arkansas coach. Walk back the other way and pretend you're the Kentucky coach. By, by the time you get back, you'll know where you're going. And look, if I'm doing the same thing, I'm going to Arkansas. Because <laughs> those fans of Kentucky, they are, they've got the lead now on Florida. Florida fans have run out one basketball coach, and that was Mike White. Kentucky fans have now run out two, Tubby Smith and John Calipari, two guys who've won national titles. Uh, Billy Gillespie was fired, but, you know, he was awful. Um, so anyway, we'll get uh, on this, that, and the other. We are going to get to some more stuff concerning Calipari. Uh, shocking, I know. It is kind of a big story. Not the biggest story today, but the big story. All right, let's get to our Leonardo's at Millhopper quick picks brought to you by Leonardo's at Millhopper, Kyle Cohen, and the great folks out there that we uh, love so much. Spent a lot of time with Kyle on Saturday, as I mentioned. Um, we're going to make it very easy for you. Orange, blue, orange, blue, fight, fight, Florida, you. You got to pick the orange or the blue. It's You're flipping a coin, guys. Let's it's, it's face it. But I wanted to give you something that everybody could – Maybe get right. Uh, most of you got the FSU over Florida baseball right. A couple of you stayed with your team and tried to root for them. And at 17 to 3, I think you probably said, I think I'm turning this off. I know I'm talking to Jeff. They were, they were glad it was a run rule, I think. Um, anyway, orange or blue, that's all you got to do. Send that into patrickdooley54 at gmail.com and you will be entered. And if you uh, are right, then you will have qualified. We're we're getting to a point where we're going to have to give, um, we don't have to, we're going to give away $25 at Leonardo's away, plus a copy of, I don't know, I may go my book, I may go, I, I'm, I'm, I may go Bob Dooley Invitational Hat. We'll be getting a new batch of those in, by the way. I may go, uh, I may go Patrick Young. But I haven't made up my mind on that. Patrick Young's book, we still have a few copies left of that signed by him. I may order some more. I'm always like happy to help out Patrick. Um, all right, let's get to our Adam's Rib Code to go. Gator of the week, Adam, of course. What a great um uh, for him to make lunch for us out there on the course every every year for this tournament. That that's just tells you what kind of a community person he is. Um, and I appreciate him so much. All right. Yeah, it was hard to find a 
Gator of the Week. And so I went with Bella Sims. Of course, Bella Sims, great uh, athlete on the swim team. Um, and she was she won two national championships. Um, she is a finalist for the Honda Sport Award, which is a huge award. It's a kind of award that um, I think within the Olympic sports is massive. Outside the Miss Olympic sports, I don't think people really, I mean, it's not like the Heisman or the Wooden or anything like that, but it's it's huge among those kind of sports. Uh, and I'm not saying they're ne- in any, any negative way. I mean, Trinity Thomas, I think, won twice. Um, their Gators have won it in the past. But anyway, in the swimming and diving part of it, she is a nominee to be the uh, Honda Sport Award winner. Bella Sims, you are our Gator of the Week. Um, let us get to this, that, and the other. This, that, and the other is brought to you by good friends at Dar Shackow Insurance. Dar Shackow Insurance, when I was at the Stop Children's Cancer thing, their name was announced a lot for giving away, giving stuff to um, to help them and being a sponsor. They're, they're everywhere, and we appreciate them. We certainly appreciate our friends at Ballyhoo Restaurant. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure Bill Reichert went up to the Monday practice round. I got to talk to him about that and see how it went for him. It sound, looked like it was beautiful out there. Uh, and of course, by Ironwood Golf Course, the home of the Bob Dooley Invitational, at least for one more year. We'll see what happens next year. But we appreciate Ironwood as well. Let's get to this, that, and the other. This was remember when SMU fired Rob Lanier, the former Gator assistant coach? And I, nobody even knew it happened. I mean, you had to be a basketball junkie to know that SMU had fired Rob Lanier. I, I didn't know it. I didn't even think about it. And it started off this incredible chain. That the that, of course, was that Andy Enfield went to SMU and then Musselman went to USC, even though he had so many opportunities at, at um, you know at, at Arkansas. I don't know if he wanted to go to USC just because he wanted to be in LA or, I mean, I know they offered a lot of money, but I mean, they've got money at Arkansas. This is why Calipari's going there. So Cal, of course, we just talked about Calipari going there and taking the job at Arkansas. So the news today, and this is the other, is that Scott Drew is the latest to turn down Kentucky. Yeah, I didn't think there would ever be a day when Kentucky would get turned down by multiple coaches, and it has been multiple coaches. It's Nate Oates, it's Bruce Pearl, it's uh, Scott Drew now, it's Jay Wright, it's Billy Donovan again for the third time, saying I haven't, I'm committed to the Bulls. So my fear is now they go back to Scott, I'm, I'm sorry, to uh, Bobby Hurley. I did, I did it wrong. Okay. Danny Hurley. I usually am really good about that versus some other people, but I know Danny Hurley. And when, and just say, look, how much do you want? How much will it take? How much NIL money will we have to raise? Here it all is. Here it is in a big Brinks truck. Because um, that's the last guy I want to coach Kentucky. Because he will bring all the things Calipari couldn't bring there. Now, he may not get as good a players, as good a future pros, but he'll have better teams. I promise you that. Uh, I don't want that to happen. But they did put out a list. I, and again, these are lists made up by media guys, so don't get too excited about it. And they had all these names that were on there. Um, and I'm looking at it, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I used to see Todd Golden's name. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, uh, that's good that people respect him enough. But he did what Cal Perry did, lost in the first round, right? I mean, he, if they want to go, uh, that's what Kentucky fans would be thinking. Well, wait a minute. He did come in here and beat us this year, but he also lost in the first round. We already had that. We didn't need to run that guy out. Um, I don't think Todd Golden is going to get that job. And I tell you what, for a lot of people, it's not the job. It's just not right because it people are nuts up there. Now, 80% of them, and I think it was Billis that said this, Jay Billis, 80% of them are great fans. And I've met many of them who I really like. In fact, one night we were at uh, in St. Louis, Chris Harry and I, and Duke Warner was there, and we were all at the bar and having a couple pops. Um, and we couldn't get out. We couldn't leave. Uh, they, their plane had was stuck in Kuwait, believe it or not. Florida's team plane. And then uh, 
And I couldn't get out either. So anyway, we're sitting there and there's a couple next to us. They're very nice. And we're talking to them. And, and of course, Chris had to point out why I was wearing a North Carolina shirt <laughs> was because I buy a shirt for whoever beats Kentucky. And they, they were so nice. And that I, by the end of the night, I decided I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. You guys have convinced me it's the wrong thing to do. And that's where 80% of their fans are. The trouble is, but by the time I got out of St. Louis, I had run into some other Kentucky fans that are in the 20%. And by then, I was buying a shirt. I was even going to buy a shirt for regular season games at that point. That's the problem. And that's what Bella said. Their lunatic fringe is way off the charts. It's a, it's by far the biggest lunatic fringe there is. I mean, I've been around Kansas fans. Those, they're fine. I, I, I likened it to, I've said this before. Kansas fans are younger, drunk, drunker versions of Kentucky fans, but they don't, they're not, there's not as much hate. There's not as much vilification. Um, and that's the way it is at Arkansas. Yeah, they want to win. But when you're 21 and three, they don't call your talk show and go, we're not giving up on you, you know, which they did to Tubby Smith. So anyway, that is this, that, and the other brought to you by Ironwood, by Ballyhoo, and by Dar Shackow Insurance. Let us finish up with our swamp restaurant games of the weekend. And, um, uh, it's a good weekend to be just laying around. Um, you obviously, hopefully, you go to the spring game. I think it's going to be a great crowd out there. Uh, if you want to watch baseball again, they're playing South Carolina. Of course, the games are at home. Six thirty four and twelve are the game times. The first two games are on SEC Plus. If you get that, the last one is on the SEC Network. The noon game, women's softball. This is a series they really need because obviously you're coming off a a real downer as we know. Um, but they've got Missouri uh, 6 o'clock, 1.30, and 3. Now, 6 and 3, the, the Friday and Sunday games are on the plus. The Saturday game, the 1.30 game, is on the SEC network. So it's if you've got the plus, you can watch all three games for both teams. If you don't, then you can watch one game from each team. Uh, let's talk about the Masters. Let's talk about the Masters. I can't wait. Can't wait to watch it today. Um, and again, you got to watch it on the plus till three. Three to seven, though, it's on today on ESPN. Three to seven tomorrow, it's on ESPN. On Saturday, it's two to seven. And Sunday, it's two to seven. They get on a little bit earlier. So you get to watch all you need to watch, believe me. Um, can't wait for it. It's my favorite. It really is my favorite sporting event. Uh, and look, I the fact that the chairman is a gator makes it a lot more fun. I, I will just say that because he's a good dude. I talked to him a couple of times and he he's a really good guy. In fact, I've heard that he may be part of the group that's trying to build that other golf course out here on uh on Parker Road, but I don't I don't know that. Don't don't quote me on that. I've just heard that. Fred Ridley. Anyway, Fred's probably going, hey, don't talk about me. This is a master's week. I know. You're right. Fred Ridley did a good job yesterday talking about golf and where it is and the ball changes and how they may have to go to 8,000 yards. He doesn't want to, but at some point they may have to. He goes, it's about all the room we've got, but the way these guys are hitting the ball, you know, guys hitting driver wedge into par fives. Uh, so they moved 13 back, moved 15 back. But two's been moved back this year. You can't go around the corner as easily, but you can still get around the corner. We'll see. I, I all in favor of, um, of scaling back the the balls and making them, um, you know, I, I know that it's not going to be for, I think it's four years before they're going to do that. And for, I think for amateurs, it's like six years. You think I'm going to put away my titleist and my, uh, ain't going to happen. Uh, all right. <laughs> Here's what I do know. That is uh, a long enough show for today. And we appreciate all of our great guests that we always have. And we appreciate Zach Rothrock who did a great job, did way better than his namesake did pitching last night. I will tell you that. She did not do so good. But she's been very good all year. She's had a bad night. Um, but appreciate Zach, and we appreciate we appreciate this storm for almost being past us. I can still hear a little thunder up there, but uh, it's almost past us. We'll be back with you again on Monday with Coach Spurrier. Until then, I am Pat Dooley. I am deep. I am way back, and I am out of here.